it is time that we get our first chance of the day to see things differently. Our first speaker, Sarah Drummond, is the co-founder and director of Snook, an award-winning service design agency working globally to design great experiences with governments and citizens. Sarah specializes in bringing people together to prototype solutions and reduce barriers. Please welcome Sarah and her talk from Wow Design to We Design. Are you a designer? Most people that I work with, now when I ask them about this, say that they're not creative, they can't draw, they're not visual, they're not designers. Most people's idea of design is kind of linked to industrial design or product design. It's about physical objects, the manifestation uh, in, in the form of an idea, things that we buy off the shelf in supermarkets, in shops, from eBay. Industrial design has almost been fetishized into a kind of cult status, a celebrity design economy. Philip Stark making weird, sexy-looking lemon squeezers, to Johnny Ive creating Apple products, and James Dyson. That's what most people consider design to be about. You can kind of trace, actually, this back to around about the 1930s, where you had people like Raymond Lowy, who created the first series of cold spot fridges. Design was used there just to add another function or a different color to try and get people to buy more fridges, to buy more stuff. But I don't really want to give you a full design thinking history timeline. Um, I want to tell you a timeline actually about my relationship with design and how I've gone from looking at very weird looking lemon squeezers to actually working and trying to embed design inside the heart of government. This is me, age seven, uh, creating the first multi-story mobile home of Duplo. When I was a child, I couldn't help, just like every other kid, look around and think, how could things be different? What if this train service worked differently? What if my mum didn't get so pissed off with the GP? You know, how could we change everything around us? And that stuck with me into high school. I was inspired directly by gin and tonic to get into the world of design. My product design teacher showed me a series of sketches for Lakeland Plastic, which showed this amazing concept of a lime and going into an ice cube uh, making box so that a lime could be solidified inside an ice cube. And I thought, the world of design has arrived. I'm here to solve first world problems. I decided to follow that career path, and I was lucky to have my imagination and visual thinking skills nurtured within high school. So I went into Glasgow School of Art and studied product design. My first project was to redesign the coat hanger. More first world problems, and yay for consumerism. The way I looked at this was by actually going out and looking at how people use coat hangers in the world. I am the officially the first person to be banned from Laura Ashley for taking photographs of women trying on dresses and shirts. But what I was doing was trying to understand how they behaved in the world and interacted with coat hangers. That's what design was about for me, was about understanding how people use things and their behaviors. You then define a problem or an opportunity. And I found when you try and hold up a shirt or a dress, that hook gets in the way of your chin. It needed to be solved. So I designed a coat hanger that removed that and created a little uh, ballpark point in the middle that you could open up a coat hanger and kind of strangle yourself, but nobody got killed. Because the design process is about prototyping and testing your idea. So I created hundreds of objects uh, to try and remove that problem. And so I learned that design wasn't really about the final output, it was about the journey to get there. And these five things were really key to me. It was around empathy, people-centeredness, prototyping, storytelling, telling a new story for the future. That's what design is. It's not about the juicy salif and the weird lemon squeezer. It's about trying and testing ideas out with people. So I went left field. I joined the public sector. Don't ask me why or how. I think they gave me some money. I said yes. I was a broke student. I worked inside Skills Development Scotland, a public body, and it was part of my master's thesis to look at how policy becomes the products and services around us that we use every day. I was looking at redesigning educational services for young people. And I can boil pretty much my whole thesis of about 350 pages into one equation, which is at the time, around about 2007, 8, and 9, the public sector really equaled no design. There was none of those values or principles embedded in the way in which we deliver services. And I wanted to think, how can you take the design studio and what I learned 
into these kind of environments, which don't really look like design studios. We've come a long way, though, since then. There were three things that I wanted to see happen when we consider taking design into government. At the very highest level, policy level, and how it's developed was to embed those principles into a do tank. And it's amazing to see places like MindLab in Denmark now taking forward this concept of bringing people into government to design services with them. Uh, a lesser known uh, website, uh, gov.uk, um, only came into being maybe about a few years ago. And they, the government embedded designers and developers into the heart of government to create services and products that work for people. This simple website, even though the Daily Mail labels, labels it as boring, may be boring, but it's important, you need to know how to re-get your passport, won a design award. It beat the shard, it beat the Olympic torch as a design award. To me, this is phenomenally exciting. But what's lacking is actually the communication platforms between citizens and government. How do we recreate the, the going out and watching people use coat hangers, but in a more serious scale? How do we talk to citizens about what kind of health services they would like, or what police force they might want to see? So I set my career on focusing on that part of the puzzle while everybody else gets on with the gov.uk's and the policy tanks of this world. I designed in 2009 with my business partner, Lauren Curry, uh, the UK's first online feedback tool for the police. At the time, it was pretty landmark because the police thought having a Twitter account was worse than carrying a gun. So we put feedback on and allowed the public to talk qualitatively about their experience with the police because they were impenetrable at the time. There was no way to give feedback. So my goal as a designer wasn't to create the final service or product. It was to create the platform that allows people to talk to the police. And my career has followed uh, this trajectory ever since. We set a company up called Snook means to cock a snook, which is to do this. And that was because I really wanted to remain in Scotland and not be another one of those designers that goes to London. So essentially, we cocked a snook to London. And we wanted to do this, move the wall design into co-design. So actually, really focus on bringing people into the design of public services and getting them to hook up with government to articulate their needs and wants. We wanted to invert the pyramids. We wanted to find a way in which power could actually be put in the hands of people for them to articulate their wants and really tool them up to have the agency to design their own services. So in our short time as a company, about five or six years, we've redesigned services within care homes. We've designed accreditation processes for the SQA. We've uh, redesigned waste services for the council, basically making it easier to moan about your bin not being collected but saving millions of pounds. We've redesigned the way that we talk about type 2 diabetes by opening up shops called No Sugar in the High Street. And we've redesigned the learner journey, how pupils move and make decisions in, within the curriculum and within schools for the Scottish government. We've tried to move into a world of co-design. But for me, this isn't still enough, because I want everybody to be designers. So how do we move from co-design to we design? There's been a movement called uh, Open Design, which is all about handing over what we would call expert design tools and putting them into the hands of masses. And this is what I focus my life on. I'm going to tell you two really quick stories about how we've been doing this. The first is about cycling. I love cycling. Who's a cyclist in here? Majority of people. That's great to see. But there's lots of barriers in the world, and I want to see cycling differently. I want the city to be easier to cycle in. With my partner, Joanna Holton and Matthew Lowell, we created CycleHack, which was a platform for people to reimagine how they wanted their city to be designed. We bring them together, and we give them the design tools to problem solve small barriers, small problems. They create new forms of signage for the city. They create different ways in which you can signpost along canals and different routes. They hack bikes themselves and reimagine how they might work in the future if they were more technology enabled. They talk about infrastructure and they work together to try and design new realities. One of the ideas that came out of it was called Penny in Your Pants, which is a way of reimagining how women could bike in skirts. It was seeing the world of cycling in skirts differently. Using one two-pence coin and an elastic band, they found a way that you could pull a skirt together to create shorts. Women liberated. But if it wasn't for the platform of CycleHack, for designing that platform to give other people the opportunity to create, this would never have happened. In fact, that one video, Penny in Your Pants, got 3.3 million hits online across the world and was featured in Huffington Post, Cosmopolitan magazine, total dream of mine. 
So those guys are now taking it to market. And what's really exciting is it's now having a benefit on some other people. So by creating a platform, there's been multiple affordances of this design. This is Shannon Galpin, who is a documentary filmmaker based in Afghanistan, who's been creating these films called Afghan Cycles. And Joel, who was part of the group, was inspired by uh, this story. So we've decided to take the product to market so that we can help take some of the profits of the product into supporting these women to cycle, because they face much bigger barriers than flashing your pants. They face real serious barriers. So as a designer, I've gone from creating that product to actually going back the way to create a platform that allows other people to be visual and consider themselves as designers. And what's important to me is that we create the platforms for people to share that globally online. We created an open source website which allows everybody to upload their concept and share it wherever they might be in the world. In fact, accidentally, this spread to 55 cities this year who have signed up to run a cycle hack. So we've now created a model, a platform, we've designed it for other people to use and scale this amazingness of no more pant flashing and more people on two wheels. And it's important to me in the design of this platform that you keep it open, you allow other people to, to take it how they want to make it happen into a reality. So I'm into designing malleable platforms that people can make their own and spread globally. But even platforms isn't enough, I want more. I'm pretty greedy when it comes to design. We need to have vision. So how do you get citizens to get involved in having vision for their own country? In 2011, we came up with a really simple idea called Dearest Scotland. I mean, it's so simple it hurts. It's an A4 word template that starts Dearest Scotland. We wanted to find a way in which to craft visions for the future of Scotland from Scottish people and abroad. What frustrates me is often that policy is developed in such an isolated context with a little bit of research and sometimes some consultation, but it's never bottom up. And I want to find a way in which everybody can feel inspired to articulate their vision. So in 2014, it was do or don't do it. It was the referendum, a really big year for Scotland. And we thought, let's go on tour. So we followed around every campaign that was going, went up to lots of different places across Scotland, Aberdeen, Dundee, Dumfries and Galloway, Arran. And we ran letter writing workshops with Scottish people. We designed tools to help people articulate what their vision was. Because when you give someone a blank sheet of paper and you ask them to draw or write or tell a vision, people seize up and they freeze. So we created and designed tools which facilitated other people to communicate their visions. And we received letters that will make you laugh, will make you cry, will make you think, will make you question everything around you. We had letters from four-year-olds, not written by them, their mums, I think, helped them. Uh, we had letters from 84-year-olds. We had letters from the north, the south, the east, the west, Italy, Canada, Australia. Letters came in digitally and through the post. In August 2014, Bill Kidd, MSP, decided to take this into Parliament. He announced that he was going to run a members debate in the chamber. I've never been so proud in all my life to have citizen centers' visions being talked about inside the heart of government. What got me, and I thought, oh God, here comes, I will not name which party, but that party, and they're going to complain about this. This isn't real, we can't validate this. Nobody did that. The partisan politics were dropped, and people talked about heart, they talked about family, they talked about friends, they talked about the future of Scotland, just from one letter template. In fact, to scale this, what we did is we opened everything up. So we're back to that open design thing again. We gave away the letter template, the tool cards, posters, this presentation, so anybody could run it. We had places as far away as, well, this is far, <laughs> far near Inverness. We had people running it that we'd never met before that wanted to get their communities involved in designing new futures for Scotland. Even STV got behind it and we got a short stint on television, which was just fantastic, although I think they put some subtitles on us because our Glaswegian accent <laughs> was a little hard to understand. So where next for Dearest Scotland? Well, in 2015, at the start of the year, we decided that the best thing we could do was to put these letters back into the hands of people and into something that people wanted to have in their home on their coffee table. So we crowdfunded on Kickstarter a campaign. Thanks to everybody, we raised £10,000 and we're now going to be publishing that book this year. But it gets better because when you open design up and you give it away, 
other people do it too, and they get inspired. In fact, Dearest Scotland is running in Dearest India. We have a Dearest Edinburgh University, we have a Dearest England, and we've had interest from across the world. Bit pissed off, India has more letters, but I'm gonna put that down to population numbers only. But to cap it all off, what is phenomenal is we received a letter uh, from the Scottish Government asking us to run an exhibition of the le letters in the public part of the Scottish Government. And I can't think of anything better to have those letters inside the heart of government, putting people's visions at the heart of democracy. I think that's incredibly exciting. But these people are amazing. This is a group of young people from George Watson's in Edinburgh. Who, uh, whose teacher decided to get a letter writing toolkit from us. So just imagine that we gave letter toolkits to every school across Scotland, and every pupil who started high school had the opportunity to write to their country. I think that'd be a pretty phenomenal thing to connect us back to democracy. So my role now has gone from products, sexy, nice objects, to being a facilitator of people's knowledge, to designing platforms that allow other people to be creative. So that when I ask them if they're a designer, they're gonna say yes. I'll leave you in the capable hands of Buckminster Fuller, who is one of my heroes in life, an amazing designer who created a hexagon house. He says, we are called to be architects of the future, not its victims. So, let me ask you again, are you designers? We're all designers. Thank you very much for listening.